uh, the last week and probably at least once before that, as I recall, I suggested that uh, our, our approach to research might be totally different if the people conducting the first research had been business professors and not sociology and psycholo psychology professors. So I'm going to talk, uh, some of you I've introduced uh, Clayton Christensen to before as part of, uh, uh, particularly if you took history of media from me. But I wanna go ahead and bring him up again because I think he is very relevant. Um, and there are some other people that uh, whose theories could be uh, relevant also, or ideas anyway, uh, to the communications uh, industry. In fact, uh, the, I will probably, I forgot to look for it this morning. Um, one of the news, newspaper organizations in America uh, hired Clayton Christensen to try to help them save themselves. Uh, as I mentioned, I don't think they're gonna save themselves, at least not very many of them. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, they, they knew Christensen's uh, reputation and they, um, they hired him to try to help them, but they didn't want to pay him very much money, uh, obviously, because uh, after him introducing his ideas, then basically they had uh, members of their own organization try to spread his ideas to everybody else and not have him actually directly involved in any research whatsoever. So uh, I think that was uh, one of the reasons why they didn't to do very well in, uh, in learning the lessons that he, he tried to teach them is that they were trying to do it on the cheap and, and didn't really let uh, pay him enough to allow him to follow through and help them. Although he did actually give probably the key recommendation that they have pretty much ignored. Um, and that is that to save themselves, the news industry has to do a lot more, has to cooperate a lot more with one another. And I say that from perspective that uh, most of my research in recent years has been about marketing. And I, and I have been concerned about marketing, not just because, uh, you know, that's been part of my career in marketing, but because that's also as a publisher, as a, I became a newspaper publisher, publisher at age 25, as a newspaper publisher, I am very keenly aware that the success of, of media in a free market, not necessarily in all markets, but in a free market, the success of news media is dependent on, on advertising and marketing. And so it's very difficult to uh, separate marketing from journalism because at least in the, again, in the, in the West, in the free market uh, systems, there is no news media without marketing. There is no news media without uh, uh, being able to sell advertising. That's how they make their money. And that's how they survive. That's how they pay their salaries, et cetera. So uh, they, they're inextricably intertwined uh, in the Western world, at least, uh, because again, without advertising, there's no medium. And so that's, as I said, the reason why I spent a lot of time uh, researching marketing is that I want to know how to save newspapers and how to save local TV stations. Uh, even though my projection is, at least at their current course, they're not going to be sick. They're going to be, they're going to die with maybe a few exceptions, uh, but by and large, they're going to die. And that's not, that's not, uh, I think, as I mentioned uh, the other day, that even though I think most of the press in America is very, very biased, is not upholding the, the ethical standards that I was taught when I was your age, even though that distresses me a lot, the option of having no news media at all um, or having biased news media is a tough decision. If I, if I had to choose, which one would I choose? No news media, biased news media. Uh, that's pretty, pretty close uh, call. Biased news media, as I, as I contended last week, is basically propaganda. But no, no news media is ignorance. So do you want to choose? So I guess you could argue that propaganda is worse than ignorance. 
that, that argument could be made. But neither one is a good situation. Uh, we, need, we need news media to be more ethical, but we also need them to survive. So I mean, that's, you kind of need both of them to have uh, really have them work properly in a democracy anyway. Uh, if if uh, what I see right now is a good share of the, of the media in America taking a side and ignoring the facts, um, and in fact, actually both sides are taking a side. <laughs> there, there is, as I conjectured last week, I've wondered recently whether if I had the money and I wanted to start a news a new uh, news medium and made it obje truly objective, uh, hire the same number of, of, of liberal journalists as I, as I hire conservative journalists, would it even survive? I, I don't even know. The, the whole country has become so uh, divided and so partisan. I mean, there are the, the most, in some ways, politically, the most important group in America are the independents that are not, who vote either direction, because they're the ones that decide whether to go Republican or Democrat, um, because neither Republicans nor Democrats have, them, have an absolute majority. So you have the independents in the center that ultimately decide an election. So maybe if I could create a news medium that would attract the independents, I would be doing a great service to America. Uh, but anyway, not that I have the money to do it, but it's just something I thought about. Because uh, right now there is none. I, I, I can't identify one news medium that is neutral anymore in America. So um, dealing with the reality of our current situation, I still go back to how do I save them, period. You know, I'll deal with trying to help them not be so biased in the future, but how do I save them from going broke? And so that's why, to me, the question of, of uh, how to compete with modern marketing uh, the modern marketing of, of Google and Facebook and so forth is extremely, extremely important. Uh, I'm not going to introduce you to my idea of how I would do it. I think I could do it. But it does require getting existing media to cooperate, which is exactly what Clayton Christensen told them and which they've never done. They've never uh, in any substantive way taken them up on that one most important of all issues. And, and my position is that the news media don't quite get it. Don't quite. They simply don't get it. And that is they're, they're like all fighting over um, uh, one life, rack, uh, life raft as the Titanic is sinking. Uh, they're pushing each other off. They're fighting for a position in that, in that life raft. And probably they're going to sink it, you know, with so many people trying to get on, they're probably ultimately tear something and, and destroy the life raft altogether. And nobody will survive. Um, to, again, going back, to the, they, they've missed the main point, and that is they have to learn how to compete against Google and Facebook. If they don't know how to f compete against Google and Facebook, then they're just fighting with other traditional media, and they're all sinking. There's none of them is doing particularly well. Uh, I think the New York Times is doing a little bit better than the others, uh, and maybe it will survive. There might be a few others that survive among the among the uh, print media, uh, among the uh, what I'm anticipating, what I'm predicting with the local TV stations. We've gone through this before. That right now. They would be all losing money if they didn't have retransmission fees from the cable companies. And the cable companies are, are losing their, their audience. Therefore, the cable companies will reduce their retransmission fees. And ultimately, the cable companies will probably go broke. Um, because there's a certain point where they no longer have enough clients to justify all their employees and all the expenses, all their overhead for keeping their organizations going. And streaming is much more uh, uh, affordable. Streaming is much less expensive than cabling is. It's also less expensive than than uh, broadcast is. Uh, a number of years ago, I was uh, attending a conference put on by the United Nations 
uh, in, it was in Kazakhstan, and they were looking at what has happened to the media uh, since uh, Kazakhstan became independent in 1992, I think. Well, nine, the last, well, December of 1991, I believe, but they kind of say 1992. Uh, so, you know, what has happened? And so this was about 20 years later, I believe, when, when I went to this conference. Um, and they, some people that were showing up to uh, uh, a panel discussion didn't show up and they just grabbed me and said, will you show up? Will you, will you go be in our panel? It happened to be about, uh, the subject was uh, the, the sad state of public TV. Now public TV is, is different than uh, commercial TV and that public TV does not try to typically it's different in every country, but public TV typically is sustained to some degree, at least, by the government and by other nonprofit organizations and so forth. And it is its purpose is to broadcast content that is more universally valued. Well, at least maybe more more universally valuable, but not popular enough to support itself by by uh, uh, advertising. So in other words, the, the commercial TV stations were not going to cover what they put on public TV. It might be longer uh, political debates. It might be uh, it might be concerts by symphonies. Uh, you know, TV isn't going to run a a, a two-hour symphony uh, broadcast. So it's things like that. Might some of the stuff is educational. A lot of it is in some way. Most of it, I would say, is some way educational. They had a lot of uh, programming for children, or uh, they do have, and they in the past maybe a little bit more funded for teaching children how to read and things like that, teaching them the things they need to know to get to be successful in kindergarten. So, you know, public TV uh, is different in different countries, but uh, after the 2008 uh, recession hit, uh, a lot of the public uh, TV stations were suffering. So what I... I kind of maybe shocked them when I said, hey, we're about ready to go, or we could go into the most successful, the most exciting period of public TV ever. And everybody looked at me like, are you crazy? We're all here sad about the loss of public TV. And I said, no, all you have to do is dump the broadcasting and go online. <laughs> because, in fact, that I... Uh, let me see, I'm going to stop this a second to go to, that's when I decided it's much easier to use technology, much cheaper than it is to keep doing it the old way. Whether you're broadcasting, whether you're printing, I, I mentioned before that New York Times could, could pay in one year, pay for giving an iPad to every one of their subscribers. And then after that, all that extra subscription money would be profit. Uh, but of course, they're afraid to do that because they're afraid that people won't want to subscribe and get it on an iPad, but then they haven't tried either. Um, you know, would people go ahead and subscribe for, let's say, three years, and during that three years, the New York Times would have would be able to uh, convince them that to keep subscribing, that we're worth it. Uh, we are even better online than we are in print. We have all this extra video. We, we're starting to start a new TV station. We're going to offer lots of other stuff. In fact, you can, you can start doing your mobile phone through us, just start thinking outside the box and offering much more things and to to build even a stronger relationship with their clientele. But newspapers are afraid to try something like that. And New York Times would be the one that would be most likely to succeed because of their brand and so forth. Um, and they are doing some stuff that kind of head in that direction, but they are afraid. They're afraid to go all the way and just stop printing. Uh, and so meanwhile, the danger of not stopping their presses is that they're losing they're losing readers the whole time that they're not stopping their presses. So they're just gradually losing the readers that they're afraid they would lose quickly if they said, we're going to cancel our printing, but give you an iPad. Um, I think that they would be more successful to stop to go ahead and announce maybe even a year in advance as of whatever, 2021. Uh, we're going to cancel our printing, but we will give every subscriber an iPad, every subscriber who subscribes for three years. Um, that's how in America we, we pay, pay for smartphones. 
uh, a lot of the big companies uh, there uh, just outright give you a phone if you sign for a long enough uh, um, subscription to their their service. Um, usually they're not not maybe as quite as good as phones that you would buy. Um, and like here, sometimes they give special deals, but, you know, let you pay a little bit and get something a little better. But uh, most of us got into, in America, got into uh, at least mobile phones, if not smartphones, based on a free offer. We'll give you the phone if you subscribe for two or three years. And it's not like the Americans aren't used to that. They, they've gone through that transition before, but the media are not willing, the news media are not willing to take that chance. Um, so, uh, the, the, uh, idea, one of the ideas that I had was simply that a lot of these newspapers need to combine if they're going to fight Facebook, uh, and Google, they need their own version of Facebook and Google. Uh, I'll just explain that in brief is that for example, um, if they all combine for one social medium and on that social medium, they had links to all of their newspapers and all their TV stations of the partners into this project, um, they would be bringing, you know, a lot of their subscribers into the social medium and they would make it maybe a little bit different. They'd start putting the top news or at least uh, you might say the, the, the promos for the top news down the uh, timeline and they click on that and it goes to the closest or to their preferred uh, local medium, news medium. For example, um, and so if it doesn't, if they don't choose their own preferred local news medium, then it goes to the closest one geographically or something. Uh, so there's a way that they could work together to fight uh, Facebook. Uh, they could also uh, fight Google by having a united uh, directory, kind of the same concept, where they you want to find an advertiser and and um, it's taking you to kind of a native advertising page representing each advertiser that each of them has. So you have millions of advertisers on a, on a common directory that you can find by name, by location and so forth, uh, being promoted by, you know, uh, potentially there's still several thousand newspapers in America that could be promoting it. Um, and, but again, when you, so as a, as you start hitting a link to find, um, a company in your area, you of course would be basically led back to the closest news medium. So there are ways that if they cooperated, that they could fight Google and Facebook, but they've never even approached it. Uh, that is what Clayton Christensen tried to teach them. Not specifically that, that's my idea, but he, he was telling them to fight these guys, you have to cooperate with each other. You have to partner in some stuff, and they have never done that uh, essentially at all. So um, that's why, again, I, I think it's uh, uh, pivotal. I have changed that also. Oh. I made some changes in this. Um, I showed this to another group. Well, the version I'm going to put on the internet on Moodle will be a little bit different, but it's almost the same. So I'll just go ahead with this. So um, let me go ahead anyway and make some points I, I would make. Uh, first off, about Dr. Clayton Christensen, for those who are not aware of who he is, um, I'll jump forward a little bit. He's considered the number one business mind in the world. Uh, and he is the creator of the notion of uh, disruptive innovation. I think I have mentioned him already in this class, but like I said, in uh, some of them, some of you that have taken my history class were introduced to him when you were much younger. And uh, anyway, the UK uh, universities uh, every two years vote on who's the smartest, the, they call it Thinkers 50, but who's the number one business thinker in the world. And Clayton Christensen won that two times in a row. So he was the reigning champion for four years. And he probably would still be. It's kind of like uh, in, in, uh, in sports, uh, there was a period of time when LeBron James was clearly the best basketball player in the world. 
Um, it's questionable now, but there was a time when he was. Uh, of many, for a long, long time, it was obvious that he was. But he didn't always win the Most Valuable Player Award at the end of the year, because after a while, they kind of got tired of giving it to one person. They thought, well, we need to give it to other people. So there's kind of, they start giving it to the runner-up, so to speak, and uh, not to him all the time. Same thing happened when uh, Michael Jordan was the best basketball player, et cetera. Um, and so it's the same thing with, uh, with this uh, award given by the UK universities. Uh, there's, their own members don't want them to give it to the same person over and over again. But he's kind of the LeBron James of, of business. Uh, he is at, uh, he's the most published uh, a member of the Harvard Business School of, uh, or, yeah, College of Business. Um, and he has, his ideas are revolutionizing the world. I'm not going to have this stuff in the PowerPoint. We're not going to read it. Uh, anyway, there he is. And we will listen to maybe a couple of his videos as we go through this. Um, maybe I'm trying to remember which ones are the most important ones. Well, maybe we'll go ahead and, and watch this, this one, this first one, and then uh, we probably won't, won't be able to watch very many, if maybe just this one. But at least introduce his ideas to you. Uh, if this is the best, uh, let me try this one. Okay, so uh, let, you know, I want to discuss then uh, Dr. Christensen's ideas and uh, go through some other case studies and we'll relate it back to our industry um, and how our industry would be different if they, if business people were the ones that, that initiated communication research. Uh, so the top companies, as he said in the video, um, they, they have to ask themselves, should we make better products that we could sell for better profits to our best customers, or maybe we ought to make worse products that none of our current customers would buy that would ruin our margins? What should we do? And that really is the dilemma. And so that's why uh, when he talks about di disruptive innovation, we're seeing uh, in field after field because, you know, more than ever because of the changing world of technology, we're seeing many big companies floundering uh, and other companies uh, taking their place. And again, uh, I think we, we talked about it previously, how academics particularly are always, you know, looking for something to be hysterical about. And they were hysterical about the big conglomerates that owned all the, all the uh, uh, communication companies in America and, and also many of them around the world. And while that is, you know, I discussed that before, and while that can be a problem, uh, and is right now a problem, uh, because most of those companies happen to be uh, very biased in a certain way, but that problem right now, it looks like it's going to disappear because they're all going, go, they're all going broke. Uh, I used to work for the, the largest uh, newspaper chain in America. And I, I may have mentioned before, but McClatchy was, uh, and they had different ways of ranking them, but at least at one point they were considered the number, the biggest uh, newspaper company in America. And uh, uh, when I was doing my research, I went to their website, went to their corporate uh, annual report, and they were excited because they were making some progress in the digital field, and they were only losing $20 million that year. Well... $20 million here and $20 million there. Pretty soon you're talking about real money. Uh, I'm not sure if McClatchy will survive or not, uh, but they're certainly, they're, they're probably in a better situation, <clears throat> better situation to survive than a weekly newspaper or, you know, some independent newspaper. Um, and if they survive, they're going to have to re, you know, reinvent themselves. Um, it's kind of, I, I, was, I was leading to another point a, a few minutes ago and kind of lost track, was uh, we're, we're going to see the same thing with local TV. I mentioned why local TV is going to disappear, is that they're surviving now off of money that the cable companies are giving them to put their programming on their local, in the local, you know, distributed through local cable. That's how they're making money now, but they're actually losing money with advertising. Their advertising is dropping very quickly. 
their advertising revenue. So once the cable companies stop paying them retransmission fees because the cable companies go broke, then the, the TV stations go broke. And there's another challenge to TV stations, and that is they've always gotten all their programming from the, the national networks, like in America's NBC, CBS, ABC, and Fox, are the, and PBS is the public broadcasting, so local uh, public ed education channels are, uh, are also have their own network, but that's supported by the government. Uh, but the other, the big four, Fox, ABC, NBC, CBS, um, what are they going to do as they start facing, as they start seeing their future dwindling because they themselves figure out what I figured out, that the local stations are going to go broke. And meanwhile, while they're taking a long time to go broke, they might take 10 years to go broke, maybe longer even. Um, all these streaming channels like Netflix are stealing their viewers. Um, about half of the people now say their favorite show is, one, is, is on one of the streaming channels, not on one of the, the networks uh, from America. And so if people are starting to say, yeah, this streaming stuff is even better than on, on broadcast TV that we're getting from one of these big four networks, uh, then that, that's, those viewers may never come back to ABC, CBS, and, and so forth. They may never come back. Once they lose them, it's hard to bring people back again. And so I noticed, I think it's CBS has started their own streaming channel now. And so you can pay and get programming for CBS directly without going through your local channel, your local station. Well, that automatically also further undermines the local stations. Because now people can say, well, I like CBS programming, but why am I bothering to get it for the local station when I like using my, my PC or, uh, or my mobile, my smartphone or something? And so the very company that has been providing programming for a, a hundred local TV stations around America is now stabbing them in the back. And they're taking their programming and selling it directly to the people. And, and that did not surprise me. I predicted that. Um, that that would come to that because they would they would themselves would realize we have to protect ourselves. We can't worry about the, our our uh, affiliates because they don't pay us anything. The, the the system in America is the networks give them free programming and the program and the local stations uh, run their national advertising and give and show their national advertising to the local audience. And so that's how they pay the the networks. Uh, for their programming is through the local advertising. But if if they realize they're going to ultimately lose their local affiliates, then they also have to protect themselves and, and enter the fight against Netflix and Hulu and all the other streamers. So they're kind of, in, in our industry, they're, we're facing some of the same sort of problems that Clayton Christian's talking about. And when he, his example, while his example is in the technical field, his, his, he, over a period of time, he's developed his, uh, his theories and he realizes that actually it's not the technology that makes it happen. Well, let me put it this way. It is, not, it is not that the technology is revolutionary, it's how did you apply the technology. That's what makes it revolutionary. So if New York Times decided to compete with all of, the other, all of its competitors by offering a free iPad, that would be that would fall into the category of a, of a disruptive technology, not because the technology is new, but because New York Times is applying in a different way. And in so doing, it might it might uh, destroy the Washington Post and other major competitors. Uh, it maybe or again, they're afraid to do it. Their own board of directors is saying, yeah, yeah, well, that's really risky to make this move. And so you have these big companies that are at the top, but what if somebody had the money to come in the bottom and work their way up? Um, anyway, that's uh, that's the, the problem they that's the sort of uh, a problem they face. Uh, so the case study that he was talking about here is Digital Equipment Corporation, that at the time was selling their computers for two hundred fifty thousand, but they saw an opportunity to go compete with the mainframes and sell for as high as a half a million per computer. Uh, their computers are about the size of this 
of this podium, but that was small compared to a mainframe. Uh, the mainframes were taking, you know, this whole room uh, and, you know, the mini computers, mini in comparison, uh, we would kind of laugh at the idea of these being mini computers as big as this lectern. But that's what they were called because it was in comparison to the mainframes that were taking the room. Um, so, you know, they, they ultimately were destroyed by all these companies coming in with PCs not because originally, as he points out, the PCs were crummy. They were absolutely crummy. But the companies that jumped in and decided to, to really focus on PCs worked at making them better and better and better and better until a PC could do everything that a, that a mini computer could do. And so that destroyed, that destroyed digital because they did not jump into the market. They decided to focus on what was making them money. And he, as he mentioned, they, none of their customers were saying that they were interested in PCs because PCs were crummy. And so why would one of their high-end customers that were willing to pay a half million dollars for their products per computer want a $2,000 crummy PC? At that time, it made no sense. And so, Digital did not pursue PCs, and in the process, they were destroyed. Um, elsewhere, he pointed out that one of the few companies that did make it, now he mentioned in, in this, that HP, Hewlett Packard, they obviously were not destroyed. They're still, they're still around, but you know, they're, they're, at least their competition in the area of many computers, uh, you know, they, they had to dump that. Uh, and so then they had to reinvent themselves and become competitors of Dell and, you know, IBM and whoever else was creating PCs. IBM was another example of a company that survived. And according to uh, uh, Christensen, they basically, in order to survive, they had to create a whole new company, a basically a whole new subsidiary, and get away from the thinking of the company that was making uh, well, first off, they had a mainframe company. They had to start a whole new company to start another company for mini computers. And then they had to start a whole new company for a comp to create PCs. Because the thinking of somebody heading up the mainframe business, it was they could come up with all the reasons why their customers would not want a mini computer. And so they would be undermining their efforts to go into the mini computer business. And the mini computer executives would undermine their their efforts to go into the PC business uh, because they the executives think totally differently and they're listening to their customers. They're doing what what professors tell them to do, listen to your customers. And the customers of the mainframe were not interested in the minis, the customers of the minis were not interested in the PCs. And so they listened to their customers and they could not wrap their head around trying to compete in this other market because uh, they had no customers that were interested in it. So uh, thus, the demise in the case of uh, digital, they never, they didn't do anything to uh, look ahead and compete in the PC market. So they just died altogether. Um, so in essence, uh, on the left side here, the, the, the dilemma is how do they compete in a new market without undermining their current market? Uh, another example that uh, Christensen talks about, again in the in the directly in the technical area, is that there were uh, you know, a couple of decades ago two companies uh, that were that were handling um, well they they created powerful reliable circuit switching, um, and then along came Cisco who created a router and the router just like in the other case the router was crummy in handling something and, that, and, and something very important to the current customers of Lucent and Nortel. It could not handle voice very well. It, it, it wasn't fast enough to handle voice. And so the customers of Lucent and Nortel said, we're not interested in the router because it doesn't handle voice and we're interested in voice. Uh, well, so what happened? The same thing he was talking about, this trend line where something that's crummy becomes better. And so gradually Cisco made their router faster and faster and faster. And they basically put, uh, you know, they jumped over Lucent and Nortel uh, with their router and, and, you know, took the market away from them. 
Um, so again, it was their decision. They're them listening to their customers who were not, who at the initial initiation of the router could see no benefit in the router. Uh, even though it was cheaper, it was not, it was not as good as what they were using at the time. So they did not encourage Lucent or Nortel to pursue it at all. And they didn't, and they paid the price for it. So one of the things when you look at in marketing is, do you always listen to your customers? And the answer is when it's, when there's any technology involved, especially there's no, or anything that's fast moving, whatever that be, but, but technology is driving it right now. Do your customers know what they will want in the future? How can they know what they will want? Um, I don't mention the PowerPoint, but, but his doctoral dissertation, uh, Christensen's was, uh, I think I've, I may have already mentioned, was about hard drives and how over the years there were, there were 51, 53 companies that made big hard drives um, that the original PCs were using. And then more, I think some came in with smaller, some came with smaller ones. And the original 53 uh, out of those, only three survived because they asked their customers, do you want a smaller hard drive? And their customers could see no reason to make it for a, hard, a smaller hard drive. They were fine with the bigger one. And so in each case, you know, as, as the small and smaller hard drives came out, um, the bigger companies start, you know, lose, lost, started losing business gradually as people realized, yeah, there is, is something we could do with a smaller hard drive, like, ah, a laptop, for example. Well, at that time, they, couldn't, they couldn't envision a laptop. Nobody was making a laptop at the time. And so they didn't go after the big companies that, that had, were making the big hard drives didn't go after smaller hard drives. And so three out of 53 or whatever it was survived and the rest all died. Uh, so again, do you listen to your customers? Not necessarily. You have to ask yourself, is there any way they can know what they will want in the future in this, in this product line? Uh, if not, then they, they're irrelevant. They're totally irrelevant. If they don't know, if there's no way for them to predict what they'll want in the future, then their opinion is not important, particularly. Uh, and you don't even know what products will come out of it. As they're talking about the smaller and smaller hard drives, again, people, there, were no, there were no portable computers. Uh, there were no laptops. I remember when I did buy a computer that was uh, about I think it's less than half the size of your standard desktop computer uh, because they used a smaller hard drive. And so it was kind of cool to have, but I still had to have an independent monitor, still had to have an independent keyboard. Uh, I was try I was doing some, uh, some consulting work. And so, yeah, it was easier to take the smaller desktop uh, than the big one. Uh, but I still had to take a monitor with me and still had to take my keyboard with me and my mouse with me and everything else. So, it was only, you know, slightly easier, but there was no PC option. Uh, there's so some of the other uh, fields. Uh, oh, let, let me cover the part on the left here uh, before I jump over that. Uh, so disruptive innovation is not about creating or marketing a better product, not initially. To the contrary, it, it transforms a relatively expensive and or complicated product into one that is financially and or technically more accessible to a much bigger market of quote unquote non-consumers. So one of the things he really drove into, uh, you know, he tried to emphasize to the newspapers was to look for non-consumers. Uh, look for people that, that were not being satisfied by current products and create products that would, uh, that would uh, be beneficial to non-consumers. And so there were some, uh, some of the ideas they had. I, I, uh, um, I don't remember many of them, but I remember there was one, they, uh, one newspaper created a digital product, basically a website uh, that and they might've had a printed version as well. I, I don't remember, but they, they created particularly a website just for moms, just, uh, you know, for working moms, how to, you know, maybe uh, advertising wise, they're looking for childcare providers, looking for ways to improve their children's lives in some way or another. It wasn't just for working moms though, but also for stay at home moms. 
um, you know, what activities and products could benefit their children. So they just focused on, on moms. Um, and, and others had lots, there were lots of other ideas that sprang out of this. As I mentioned, they hired Christian Sun to get, to get them started, but then they, they mostly just cooperated in sharing the ideas that different companies were, were trying uh, so that you know, other companies could try them also. But that still, uh, that, that has done very little good because they were not partnering ideas. They were still just sharing ideas of maybe making a, another product or two products that might help a little bit, but none of their ideas were, were world changing and, and they did very little good for them. They still lost most of their advertising despite those changes they were making. Um, while technology is usually involved and in most of his, his examples earlier, and, and I think even he thought it was mostly tied to the technology originally, but as, they, as he started looking at other disruption in the marketplace, he realized that it was just that the technology was very frequently the key, but it wasn't necessarily uh, that the technology itself was disruptive. It was how the, the technology was used. And so again, the idea of, of, of you know, giving all, you know, New York Times giving all their, their uh, subscribers a, an iPad is kind of that idea that you're using technology, but it's not that you invented the technology, you just decided to use technology in a different way. Um, anyway, some other case studies though that kind of show that, um, well, the first one, is more a little more technical again, but uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, until the end of the 1960s, and to some degree beyond that, the biggest uh, the biggest producer of TVs and radios was a company called RCA. Uh, it also started one of the uh, I think it actually ended up it actually started two of the national networks of the TV networks. Uh, but the, the government made it break it into half. So I think it was NBC and ABC that were actually created by RCA. Um, but anyway, RCA was uh, creating uh, TVs and radios that were really big and they were still using vacuum tubes as their way of, of, of uh, handling the data you might say, to create the signal, you know, to create the sound, create the, the, uh, the pictures for their TVs. And so they had to be quite big. TVs also, in that time, TVs were typically the size of the lectern also. A screen and a whole bunch of tubes inside the body of the, of the TV. Um, radios were almost as big, the same thing. They had a whole bunch of vacuum tubes inside the body. So the typical family had one TV and they had one radio. Well, first off, in the 1930s, they had one radio. So everybody would sit around. If you wanted to uh, participate in radio, you had, the whole family would sit around the, the family room, the living room, and listen to a, a radio show. Um, and same thing that happened in the 1950s when they started replacing the radio with TV, a big, expensive TV. Everybody in the family would sit around watching one TV. And there were typically like maybe three local channels to watch uh, through the broadcast. There was no cable at that time. Uh, there was, uh, um, anyway, and there were just, there were three networks and those three networks had a local affiliate. And so you tried to, you might've used a tall antenna, something to handle the, to reach, you know, get the signal from the local affiliate, ABC, CBS, or NBC. There was no Fox at the time and there was no cable at the time. Uh, cable initially became invented for uh, communities and they would put a, a giant uh, antenna on top of a mountain and run a cable down to the houses and their only purpose of cable in those days was to get a signal um, and still it was the same sort of signal that you would get if you were in town living close to the broadcast station um, there were, was no extra programming they still only got the three channels uh, maybe four if they had public TV or something uh, but they were just ca trying to capture the broadcast signal and share it with everybody in town. That was the original cable concept. And it was another 10 years or so before companies started saying, hey, we could do more than this. We can add a whole bunch of our own content 
and sell our own advertising and, and thus cable became much bigger than it was initially. Anyway, so back to RC and Sony. So in the end of the 1960s, Sony came along with, um, they, they produced, start producing, um, so you don't have it, uh, portable phones uh, or port portable uh, radios that they call transistor radios. And they were a little bit bigger than this, maybe twice as big as this. But they were small enough that somebody could just carry them around, a teenager or whatever. And indeed, that was their, um, their non-consumer. Their non-consumer market was teenagers. And so uh, they had, um, they, it was really, uh, they made it with transistors instead of vacuum tubes. That's how they could make them smaller. And the, uh, the, the product was really crummy. The, the sound was very tinny. It was very, wasn't very, uh, didn't, didn't give you all of the, the uh, uh, sound frequencies that, that would give you like stereo, anything close to stereo. It was really a bad product. But as in many of these cases, it was better than nothing. And so for a non-consumer, like a teenager who wanted to listen to his rock and roll and his parents hated rock and roll and his parents wasn't gonna let him, they weren't gonna let him listen to it on the family radio, uh, the little crummy transistor radio was better than nothing and it was cheap. And so, so Sony found uh, a, a market of non-consumers. And so they jumped into the American market and they did quite well as they, as they built up that market of non-consumers. But also, meanwhile, RCA was asking itself, do we want to get into transistors or do we want to stay with our vacuum tubes? The transistors are crummy. Uh, our current customers, you heard this story before, right? That our current customers aren't going to want to buy a transistor. They're buying a, a radio to sit in their, their family room and, and uh, uh, you know, the whole family can sit around in really good quality. So our customers aren't going to want a transistor, a radio. So why should we even mess with it? Uh, you know, these Japanese have come in here and are going for the teenage, this teenage market and, you know, they're going to grow out of it. You know, we don't have to be afraid of the Japanese because uh, with their crummy little transistor radios. Except those darn Japanese guys better and better and better at it. And so pretty soon the transistors were just as good as the vacuum tubes. And so the Sony took over the market. And RC is hardly, I think it still exists, but it's hardly heard of anymore. It has a very small market share um, because they did the same thing with TV then. Uh, the Sony uh, started making TVs with, with transistors and suddenly uh, a TV could be, it was portable. So instead of being as big as this lectern, now again, it was cheap, much cheaper and you could carry it around and so suddenly now there wasn't just one TV in the household. There was maybe two or three TVs in the household. And again, the transistors they were using for the TV got better and better. And pretty soon they were able to jump into color TV. At, that, at first it was black and white. Uh, so again, be, be, they, they jumped in and they took over and dominated the whole market uh, pretty much from RCA. But now in a non-electronic area, you had Detroit and Toyota. This one's hard to tie into technology, particularly, uh, but it was still the same principle, is that uh, those darn Japanese again showed up with a crummy, with a crummy car to compete with Ford and, and General Motors cars, who had monopolies, who were oligopolies, whatever, uh, and dominated the market in America. And these guys came in with these crummy little cheap cars that were, that, you know, and and they there was no profit margin. The the uh, Ford and and uh, and General Motors had unions that demanded higher rate wages. They couldn't really. They'd be losing money to compete with the cheap cars that that uh, Toyota was producing and and bringing to America. And so they decided, why lose money in something that is this crummy? Our our customers, what? Our customers don't want this, right? Um, and so they, they make the conscious, educated decision. There's no reason for us to compete with a, a profit-losing product 
to fight off Toyota when they don't compete with us. They don't compete with our products that are making us the best profits. So we don't have to worry about Toyota. Well, then they didn't. But now Toyota products have become better and better and better. So now they're competing with everybody. Uh, and so, and Detroit is, uh, the, you know, Ford and General Motors are from the city of Detroit. Um, they, uh, you know, they're, they're losing huge amounts of their market share. Um, and more recently, Uber or Grab versus taxis. That is, it, it involves technology, right? But it's not a major thing. If you look at, at Grab, techno, you know, it's not a technology company. They're just found a way to use technology in an innovative way to let private drivers make some money and for them to skim a bunch off the top and become rich. The same with Airbnb versus hotels is that they came in again. It's not really, they didn't invent any technology other than just how do we use this technology to compete with these big expensive Marriott hotels and these other hotels and make a profit, you know, make some money for homeowners and for ourselves. And so uh, they're a, a billion dollar company now too, a multi-billion dollar company. So we see as we look through, uh, look over the last few decades, in case after case, technology is involved, but it doesn't, it isn't necessarily the technology itself that is disrupting market after market after market. It's how do we use it? Uh, I kind of skipped over a slide when we first got started. Uh, I may have shared this idea with some of you before again, but uh, when I, when I, uh, well, yeah, there's a guy named uh, Seth Gooden and he has uh, several uh, good videos on uh, TED.com and most of them being also copied over to YouTube nowadays. Maybe he tells a story of uh, back in the early 1910s, there's a guy named Otto Rowetter uh, who sold his jewelry company in the U.S. to fund his efforts to invent the first bread slicing machine. But for 15 years, it was a failure. Uh, nobody saw any reason to pay anything extra to buy sliced bread. Why has somebody slice our bread for us? We have a knife, a perfectly good knife to slice bread with. So why buy sliced bread? Um, later, the toaster was invented and that gave some reason, uh, but still nobody, very, very few Amer Americans bought sliced bread. It's a little more expensive. Why buy something more expensive? And then along came uh, a company called Wonder. Well, their product naming was, a, was Wonder Bread. And they had a very pretty wrapper on the outside, a plastic wrapper and, and like balloons all over it. And it, and, it, and it promised to, they had put more vitamins into the bread and so it made kids healthier. And they competed with price also. And suddenly uh, about 15 years after it was invented, uh, suddenly it took off right in the middle of the Great Depression right in the worst depression in, in our history, uh, this product took off because Wonder Bread figured out how to market it. And so within, well, I think it's one year, more than half of the bread in America was suddenly being uh, sold as sliced bread because Wonder decided to promote it and to, to figure out how to market it. Um, and so in the middle of the depression, it didn't matter that nobody had any money, uh, they just figured out how to market it. What one reason why this appeals to me is that I used to live in Kazakhstan for nine years and 99% of the bread there is not sliced bread. They still, nobody has marketed it to Kazakhstan. And so 99% of the bread sold in Kazakhstan is still uncut. Um, and so, you know, some of these innovations may take a century or more to spread around the world because Nobody gets around to it. Now, part of the problem with you know, Kazakhstan, of course, was a Soviet company, country until 1992. And so it's relatively young, but it's interesting to watch, to look at Kazakhstan uh, from the eyes of a marketer and as a business entrepreneur that they just don't, that there are so many opportunities in Kazakhstan because nobody's come to market uh, what has been already been successful around the world.
So one of these ideas that uh, that college professors might teach you is uh, don't waste resources in unprofitable product lines. Would that make sense? Of course that makes sense. Well, until you're destroyed by somebody coming in with a cheap product that you chose not to not to compete with. Um, and then, yeah, you just been destroyed. It's too late. Uh, ignore low quality products. Well, not a good idea because uh, low quality product can become better products uh, such as the transistor radio, etc. Uh, so you have to be careful about making that early judgment and stuff. Um, one of the uh, videos that I uh, recommend is uh, uh, one of the associates of Steve Jobs. Um, he actually worked for Apple twice uh, early on in the very beginnings of the company and then came back a little later. Uh, I'm not going to uh, go, you know, we're not going to listen to this video uh, right now, but uh, in one, he uh, goes through what he calls uh, that, well, he actually, I have actually linked to two different videos, but one of them is the 10 things he learned from Steve Jobs. Um, and I can't remember which one it is that this one associates with, but anyway, one of his principles is jump to the next curve, which really is what Christensen is saying also, is that you, that, that a company needs to be thinking about the next curve because if you don't, somebody else will. And the problem is that next curve may require you put some resources into something that you don't know if it's going to be profitable or not. You're taking a risk to try to uh, keep your, your uh, technology as current as possible, not knowing for sure where it's going to lead you. And so RCA deciding not to continue working on transistors destroyed the company pretty much. Um, and so uh, you need to be visionary and look ahead to the next curve. And this was what Guy Kawasaki taught, but also that is more or less what, what uh, one of the principles of, of uh, Christensen also, that is that technologically you need to be looking to the next curve. He would add to it, figure out how to use it in a different way. Not, it's not just the technology, but how do we use this technology in a way that's revolutionary, that we can disrupt the market. Uh, the other thing that Guy Kawasaki uh, said he learned from Steve Jobs is uh, don't worry, be crappy. Um, and that's the point also that Christensen says is that if you're, if you're launching a revolutionary product, it is going to be crappy, it's going to be bad. Just get into the market and make it better. And while you're, you know, you're working to make it better, your competitors are going to be laughing at you. That's good. The longer they laugh, the better. Uh, because the more likely you're going to take up, you're going to steal the market from them. So don't worry, be crappy. So anyway, here are uh, some of the other things he, he taught. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, I guess one of these, I can't remember if I shared this idea before, but I think one of the things he pointed out from Apple's own experience uh, was once you launch a new idea, sometimes it's not you that uh, will save your company. It's not your best ideas, your new ideas. That once you, you launch, sometimes it's somebody else. But just by launching and, and opening it up for other people's creativity as well, and his point was, uh, his example was his own company, Apple. He said Apple would have died if it were not for, for uh, uh, desktop publishing. Is that it was a more expensive product and and uh, the IBM's computers, uh, IBM com base computers or IBM computers overall uh, were cheaper and for doing things like uh, that most people needed, such as word processing, there was no reason to pay more to buy Apple. And so uh, they, were, they were going down, they were going to die. And then along came uh, um, Aldous was a company who, who created first created desktop publishing. Some of you have taken desktop publishing classes, some from me, some from someone else. But you know, for companies like you know Quark Express was one of the early ones. Um, Adobe, of course, uh, uh, is is kind of dominating the market right now. Uh, but that's uh, that's what saved 
what, what saved Apple is that they had more processing power than IBM computers did. And so the professionals in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and still even today to some degree, uh, a lot of them prefer, uh, uh, prefer Apple products uh, because they, they tend to do better with, with higher uh, memory uh, software and so forth. So, so uh, it has become, uh, you know, that saved them. That saved them because they weren't going to, they weren't going to outcompete IBM uh, with word processing. They were going to die on that, with that product. And so it was a different company that saved them. It was Aldous. And then other companies jumped into desktop publishing as well, including Adobe and including other companies. Another principle um, well let me maybe we take a break here. Uh, what have people found about uploading? Do we need to pass this? Are you? Okay. Well then I will begin passing this around for you to upload. I created a a folder, it should be at the top, uh, zero, zero project, something like that. So it should be at the top of the list, but you can go ahead, uh, be sure to, when you upload, um, put something that, that suggests, that, that tells me which product, you know, which, uh, uh, yeah, you know, which audio you were using, so like the, pro the audio number, and maybe one word to represent that, the name of the speaker or the name, uh, you know, of the, uh, some idea that's related to it, but particularly a number. I'll probably be looking at the numbers. Uh, so start off with the number of your, of your uh, audio that you, that you took from, uh, um, from IRE. Well, it's not due today, but those of you that have it and want to upload it, you can. I'll pass it around next Friday also, or you can come to my office. Um, an, another area that uh, Dr. Christensen talks about that does very much relate to us uh, is the idea that uh, the customer, as Peter Drucker said, so he's kind of discovering, rediscovering uh, a Drucker principle. D Peter Drucker was, uh, some people say, the father of, of uh, business theory. Uh, he was the first one to really start exploring uh, business from a more scientific perspective uh, many decades ago. But anyway, so one thing he said was that the customer rarely buys what the company thinks it is selling him. And so um, Dr. Christensen suggests um, in looking at starting a new business, whether it's a publication, a website, whatever it is you're trying to do, this is part of what, what he was trying to teach the, uh, the U.S. Uh, newspaper uh, publishers, was you need to look for the job not done. What is not being done that people would like done? And so it's kind of like hiring somebody. When you buy a product or a service, it does something for you. And so that's what Peter Drucker is talking about, is that when some, is exactly that. People buy something, and you may think you're selling them something, one thing, but they're really, they're buying it with a different purpose. And so the individual motive, motive for buying a product or service may not be what you think you're selling them. And so this is a case example uh, from Dr. Covey, or Dr. Christensen rather, about that. Uh, he was hired by a, uh, a, a group of, uh, or I guess one owner owned a bunch of franchises of McDonald's. And, uh, they were trying to increase their sale of milkshakes. And they would, they would uh, do a number of scientific experiments to try to discover how to sell more milkshakes. And so they, for example, brought people in and they give them different uh, formulas of milkshake and, and ask them which one they preferred and so forth. And uh, so they would tell them which they thought was best. And so they're trying to do this scientifically uh, but when they got all done and changed their milkshake recipe or whatever, they would not increase their sales. And they tried all sorts of stuff and they could not increase their milkshake sales. And yet they were trying. These are very smart people. McDonald's hires very smart people to handle their marketing. And so they did everything that their typical 
uh, business professor taught them in, in conducting these experiments and stuff, uh, these marketing uh, uh, surveys, marketing experiments, and everything, and they could not boost their milkshake sales. So in comes Dr. Christensen and his team, and they uh, they decide first off just to come in and and watch for one day and see who was coming, and what they you know what other factors could they identify that made them different, or you know made them distinctive. And so they he sent somebody in early in the morning, and a whole bunch of people started coming to buy milkshakes in the morning. And he thought that was a little bit odd, but okay. But then as he as they started. Uh, identifying other factors, most of the people who were buying milkshakes in the morning did not stay to drink them. They took their milkshakes, got back in their car, and drove off. And in many cases, just one person. Just one person, buy one milkshake, get in the car, drive off. And time after time throughout the morning, this was happening. And so um, in the afternoon, they had a different set of people. They'd typically come and eat at the restaurant, or maybe they'd get something, but they'd usually get more than a more than just a milkshake, if they came in the afternoon, uh, they would buy it with a hamburger or whatever. So it was a different type of customer, it seemed like, in the afternoon uh, and in the evening. So they were particularly interested in this early morning crowd. And so they, uh, when they, they sent, uh, I think Christensen himself went out there and they started interviewing people and asking them that question, you know, what job is this milkshake doing for you? which seems like a very odd question to ask somebody. And at first, uh, if they, he sounds like that's actually how they phrased it, which kind of confused the respondents. Uh, but then, and so they asked another question, last time you needed this job done, what did you hire? And so as people started understanding this concept, they would say, well, uh, before I bought donuts, but they're kind of messy as I drive in my car, get my handles all, my fingers all sticky, that doesn't work very well. And some other people say, well, I, I, I was buying bagels, but then I have to, you know, kind of drive the car with my knees as I put cream cheese on the bagel. Uh, that's not a very good idea. Uh, other people said, well, I, 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 you know, bought a Snickers bar, but uh, I kind of feel guilty about that. It has so much sugar in it and it's gone very quickly anyway. Um, and so they went through all the things. Somebody tried buying an apple. And so any, ultimately they, they figure out what the job was. And the job related to the fact that these people were all commuting. They had to drive in their car for somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes or even longer uh, to go to work. They were commuting to work or they were, uh, their job required them to drive around a lot. And they were just basically trying to do something to make things more interesting. And even though they'd just eaten breakfast, maybe, maybe not, uh, they might have just, you know, missed breakfast, but even if they did eat breakfast, they wanted something to kind of occupy their time and give them something to think about besides just driving, 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 driving. And so they had a job that related to commuting. It's a totally different job than what was being done at lunchtime or at dinner time uh, when people are just buying food, right, to eat, to consume. They're filling their stomach. And this wasn't really that purpose. They were buying something to distract themselves as they were driving for a, a long periods of time. And so, again, he just rediscovered what Drucker had taught, that the customer rarely buys what the market, what the company thinks it's selling. Um, and in fact, as he analyzed it, is actually who were their competitors with, for these milkshakes? Was it uh, Burger King? Well, not, not totally. Because, as these people said, they were also competing against donut shops, bagel shops, uh, candy bar stores, you know, grocery stores that would hand, you know, sell fruit and all that sort of stuff. They were competing against far more than just uh, Burger King milkshakes because uh, this was, you know, it, we had a different purpose that could be, could be filled by some other product besides a milkshake. The milkshake just happened to be the, the product that these that these uh, commuters found the best, and and McDonald's uh, is known for very thick milkshakes that are kind of it's very it takes you a long time to, to drink them, uh, especially if you have a small straw, you're sucking on that thing and it takes you a long time to to do it because of how thick their milkshakes are, which 
exactly met the needs uh, of, of the customers. Uh, they did make some recommendations to, uh, to enhance their milkshake sales by maybe uh, like if for strawberry shakes, maybe some put some bits of strawberries, real strawberries in there to kind of give them a little extra spark and maybe put up a milkshake machine where somebody could self-serve and go get their milkshake and, and uh, pay for it at the milkshake machine, not have to wait for, a, for a somebody, not to wait in line for their milkshake, that sort of thing. Uh, they did uh, increase their, with their various recommendations, now that they understood what the what these people were buying, they were able to to uh, like double their their sales, because now they understood again what they were buying, so they could market to that to those people. So uh, again, this is one of the ideas that he he uh, taught to the newspaper association, was that you you know look for jobs not done, and figure out how you can do those those jobs for people. Uh, so thus you know the ideas of of uh, you know providing for the needs of a of a mom who has a bunch of kids or whatever that you know they're they're working mom or stay at home mom either case you know what what can they do for their kids maybe recipes maybe uh, preschools maybe whatever a, a mom might need uh, you know that was just one idea that that one uh, one uh, publisher decided to try and with some success so it's important to remember as we think about in our own industry. As I said, newspapers in America have been thinking about this. Um, they have not done it real successfully because they ignored his other suggestion of do, doing more partnering. And so they're still trying to fight Facebook and Google one-on-one. -on -one. And one-on-one, -on -one, they're not going to beat Facebook and Google. That's where I think they're failing is they, they didn't listen to the second part. Um, they, they have a little bit of uh, as I said, they, they published books about all these ideas that different companies tried. So in that sense, they were kind of cooperating with each other. But that's not enough to fight off Google and Facebook. Uh, you have to do something more directly or you're still going to keep losing advertising and go broke. Uh, another concept that, uh, that relates to this is uh, Dr. Christensen it says that basically people treat the uh, the formulas, the ratios, the principles that are taught by finance professors much too seriously, and indeed it's the it's the principles or the uh, the metrics that finance professors teach, even at Harvard, that basically destroyed many of these companies he, that he he studied. Uh, and so he says, actually, it's like a lot in a lot of cases, people look at these um, metrics that, that have been created by finance professors as if they're a religion. And so that's why he kind of showed what his version of the Ten Commandments or something of, uh, that, you know, God may have written uh, because uh, that's how people are treating these and they're destroying their companies by thinking that these are true. And they're not true in all situations. They're in some, some cases true. If you have no competition, if you have no disruptive competition, then the principles are maybe, well, even then they're, they're dangerous. They're dangerous. And I'll get to that in the next slide. Um, so should, be, should they be following the religion of finance professors? So here's some of the concepts that Dr. Covey has come up with. Uh, first off, he identifies three types of innovation. On the left side um, is uh, disruptive innovation. Towards the top, it's uh, called sustaining innovation. And over on the right side, um, efficiency innovation. And I think I'll just, uh, uh, just read what he wrote in his, uh, this is a slide I stole from him. He said, disruptive innovations always struggle to attract capital and managerial attention, which is why some companies go broke. His, his disruptive innovation is the one that will, that will get them to the next curve, so to speak, as Kawasaki was, was saying, get them to the next curve. And if they're not spending money for disruptive technology, somebody else is. You can, you can bet on it. Somebody's developing disruptive technology or disruptive innovation. Uh, rather, not just technology, but innovation. 
Uh, it could be marketing innovation, could be, again, there's different types of innovation, but it is disruptive in nature. Um, the other type, the second type at the top is, uh, uh, is sustaining innovations. And it says the profitability metrics for sustaining innovations, as you know, according to the finance professors, always are higher than those of disruptive innovations. So when you start figuring, when you start figuring the uh, the uh, you know what you're likely to make, how long it'll take you to make it, and so forth, the amount of risk that's involved, always the finance the formulas of the finance professors are going to say. Uh, you're better off investing in sustaining innovations. Make your products just a little better, a little better, a little better, a little better. Uh, stay in front of the competition that way. But they're not talking about the disruptive competition. They're talking about the other companies that are also just going, get making their products a little better, a little better, a little better. They're not talking about somebody who's going to throw a curve at them and, and you know, suddenly disrupt the, the market. Uh, the third type on the right side is... Um, is called sustaining, excuse me, it's efficiency innovation. The profitability metrics of efficiency innovations always are better than those of sustaining innovations. So let me just, uh, we, we've already been talking about disruptive innovation. Let me go back to sustaining innovation. Sustaining innovation is how to make your product just a little bit better at a time. It's how to just sustain your position in the marketplace, basically. We're going to be make our computer a little bit better. We're going to make uh, Airbnb a little better. We're going to make everything's going to be just a little bit better. Or, or probably a better example, the hotels are going to make their product a little bit better. And then along comes Airbnb and blows them out of the water because their sustaining innovation in the hotel does not match the competition, the disruptive competition that Airbnb brings into the marketplace. Uh, that, so, so while they might be doing better against another hotel by doing sustaining innovation, that sustaining innovation only works as long as there's no disruptive innovation. Um, anyway, the, with uh, efficiency innovation, that is how to, as this, the name suggests, is how to be more efficient. As the next slide uh, points out, uh, I'm going to start on the right side this time. Efficiency, innova efficiency innovation uh, increases, uh, or it increases free cash flow. So in other words, you have more money because you're saving money but it also eliminates jobs almost by definition. The place to become you know, uh, more efficient is almost always in reducing labor. That's where you become more efficient. That's not, uh, maybe there may be other ways, but it's almost universal. If you're gonna become more efficient, you're gonna use technology better. You're gonna do something that helps you fire some people because payroll is, is, a, is a huge part of any business. And so efficiency innovation it frees up capital. It doesn't improve your products. It just makes you more profitable by, by being able to fire people. And so, so if when you're in a position, it's been my claim, my, my analysis, that the reason why the U.S. economy and to some degree the world economy, uh, because it depends so much on the American economy, the reason why things took off almost the day that Trump took office was this fact is that investors did not trust Obama and they were not investing in a disruptive innovation. They were at that time during Obama's time were investing in sustaining innovation and efficiency innovation. There was no disruptive innovation going on and they just froze. Cost money is too risky. They just froze that that part of their budget. Uh, and I uh, well, let me explain this and I'll come back to some other data uh, from another video that, that would support that. Uh, but anyway, so uh, on this slide, uh, the, the disruptive innovation again creates corporate and, and economic growth. It creates jobs. It, it, it needs capital to do it, but it is the thing that keeps you on the cutting edge. It's the things that build jobs, gives you new products, new services. Disruptive innovation is your future. And so that all these examples of companies that are failing are, is because they did not pursue disruptive innovation. They let somebody else come into the market with disruptive innovation. And that person or that company destroyed them. Um, they were totally committed to sustaining innovation because that's more that's safer, uh, well, sustaining and efficiency. Um, so they were kind of those two 
And in some cases, they were going too far to efficiency to where they weren't even improving their product with sustaining innovation. Uh, they were just getting more efficient, laying people off, trying, they were scared of the market, they're scared of the economy. They were just trying to survive. Now to support that, my hypothesis, that that's what happened in day one of the Trump presidency, uh, the, the numbers show that. The numbers show that, that the, the US economy was flatlined until Trump took over and then it zoomed. What could it possibly explain that when he hadn't done anything yet? I mean, he had done nothing yet, but suddenly the, the economy took off. Well, some of that was uh, I, I got from a uh, video of Dr. Christensen where he was, uh, they were having a discussion, he was having a discussion with a guy, I need to bring up his name here, uh, Andreessen, um, Mark Andreessen. So Mark Andreessen uh, was the creator of the first, at least the, one of the earliest and the very, very popular web browsers called Netscape. And so he made a lot of money with Netscape and then he started another company that also brought in a lot of money uh, before it collapsed. I mean, they, in both cases, his products have long disappeared. But by taking it to the, uh, to the marketplace and getting more investors, he made his money off of other investors believing in the company. Um, and they did make money for quite a while, but uh, uh, Google had a better uh, business plan. And so Google, I think, was what destroyed uh, Netscape. Uh, but meanwhile, he made enough billions of dollars or whatever that he uh, is now an, a, uh, an investor in Silicon Valley and one of the top investors, uh, along with his partner, has also had a similar background. And so this discussion is between Clayton Christensen, the guru of gurus in the field of business, and, and uh, uh, Mark Andreessen, who was one of the early gurus in the, in the digital age. Um, and <clears throat> Part of what, uh, uh, well, first off, Christensen was, was talking about entire economies, economies that, that were thinking too much about efficiency and sustaining <clears throat> and entire economies like the US economy was not doing enough in disruptive innovation. And therefore, the, the, we had like five, 6% uh, unemployment during the Obama years and almost immediately when Trump took over very, very quickly, it dropped down to, you know, three and a half percent and so forth. And so it pretty much fell in half almost immediately. Well, which of these innovations creates jobs? Disruptive innovation. Efficiency destroys jobs. Uh, sustaining innovation creates a little, but not very much net growth. And so the one, the one type of innovation that explains what happened when Trump took over was that suddenly companies decided to invest in disruptive innovation. And he also pushed through a tax cut to help uh, to incentivize companies, corporations to start uh, working into in the disruptive innovation area. Uh, one of the things that uh, he's that uh, Christensen points. Well, let me go go on before I come back to that. Uh, then, according to uh, Andreessen, at that time, uh, actually their discussion took place in early 2016, so before the election, before Trump became president. So they were looking at the economy in early 2016 and making these comments. And uh, again, uh, Christensen was saying that the economies were being based on the second two types of innovation and not nearly enough on disruptive innovation. And uh, Andreessen pointed out that the Fortune, uh, the Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 500 corporations, were giving most of the money back to their investors. They were not taking they were whatever profits they were making, they were just giving back to their investors. They were not keeping any for disruptive innovation. And and yet, uh, so they're trying to keep their investors happy, but um, you know they were just stagnant. That was the decision they're making. They were giving out trillions of dollars uh, in in uh, you know to their investors and not keeping any for for innovation, at least not for disruptive innovation. Uh, also, then. Uh, he also pointed out that at that time, people were so scared of the economy that there was something like five or six trillion dollars invested into uh, negative yield bonds. 
In other words, they were they were taking their money, putting them into government bonds, like maybe buying bonds from America or whatever. And those bonds, in this case, that, that there were five trillion dollars or more being invested into negative yield, which means they were guaranteed to lose money. They, they, were, they were not going to be profitable. They were just to be safe. That was the only purpose in buying negative yield bonds. They were from strong enough uh, countries or whatever that they, the only guarant or the only thing they got out of it, no profit, but security. That's all they're looking for. And so again, that, that uh, so there were trillions of dollars that were sitting around in, in negative yield bonds and that were available by corporations they didn't pay them out uh, to their stockholders. That money was just not going into disruptive innovation until uh, Donald Trump convinced, you know, gave people a sense of, of confidence that it was time to pull their money out of, out of bad investment, bad safe investments and start uh, moving it over in disruptive innovation. Now, one of the things that, uh, that he does point out in making this choice, and again, why it's a hard choice sometimes, is, is yes, disruptive innovation is more expensive uh, and it's more risky. Or excuse me, I just say more, not necessarily more expensive, but more risky, definitely. Uh, and um, and it usually takes a longer period of time to pay off. And so a disruptive innovation might take five to ten years to pay off, you know, to, to start making a profit, in other words. Um, until then, you're all you're into a development stage. So you are innovating, you're developing, you're preparing this new product mm -hmm. for the next curve. And uh, and then, you know, maybe four or five years into it, you actually come to market. And so it's five to 10 years before it starts paying off the investment. Whereas efficiency is usually has a fairly automatic and quick and safe uh, payback. And so again, why companies were making that choice, going to efficiency innovation, some sustaining innovation, but during the Obama years, nobody was doing uh, disruptive innovation, at least not very many people were. Okay, last thing I want to cover in this is that the competition that has, has risen uh, because of, of such innovations in, in our particular field, for example, of, of uh, newspapers. Uh, but similar things with, with uh, broadcasting, but uh, this is more for newspapers. But uh, newspapers... Uh, 20 years ago, uh, we saw how much, how many billions of dollars. In 2005, they, you know, the newspapers in America were making somewhere close to 60 billion dollars a year in advertising. Um, now they're making more like 15 billion dollars in advertising, so it's dropped dramatically. Uh, Google in 2005 was making hardly any money at all. Uh, now they're making, uh, you know, 70, 80 billion dollars in advertising. Uh, so anyway, with a, the typical new newspaper uh, 20 years ago, they had what we call the classified section. I, I don't know how much uh, of a classified section your local newspapers have, but it's typically where you find things like um, jobs, for uh, you know, available jobs that people can look for. Um, yeah, they'll find their uh, used cars for sale. Uh, use motorcycles, uh, they'll look for uh, houses for sale, things like that. And so the company, I, you know, the newspaper I had that with McClatchy, uh, that was, they probably had uh, each day, uh, that was their most profitable section. Mo most newspapers, their classified section was their most profitable section. Uh, I'm trying to remember back, probably e even on a slow day, the uh, the uh, classified section for the newspaper I was at was probably, you know, six, seven, eight pages. And on average, on Sundays, it would be like 20 pages, all of really tiny ads. Well, they'd have some uh, display ads on the page uh, by car uh, companies, stuff like that. But but this, would, this was not just, here all your content was paying for itself. 
was paying you a lot of money and yet it was also a reader item is the ideal type of advertising to make money with because people wanted to look for a job they wanted to look for a new car they or a used car they wanted to look for the stuff that was in the classified section and so this became their reader material but people were paying to put the reader material in the paper so they were getting people coming and going they were getting people subscribing to their paper to a large degree because of the classified section and they were getting people to pay for the classified ads so that's why it was by far the most profitable part of the newspaper uh, when you accumulated all these small ads people were paying you know they might be paying like fifteen dollars for for three lines of type and then you added you added all those eight columns of you know, of small type and so forth they put them in smaller type wasn't big type small type eight columns and uh, uh, they were making a lot of money from that when I was uh, your age in a class on uh, newspaper management they said that's how you could know whether a newspaper was successful or not how big is their classified section because the classified se se section suggested how loyal their their uh, uh, customers were their consumers their subscribers um, how how loyal they were how involved they were with the newspaper so if you had a newspaper with many pages of classified advertising that meant it was a very well established newspaper with very strong readers and and uh, that felt uh, some um, commitment to that newspaper and so again when I was your age that was the number one way of knowing whether a newspaper was successful or not was look at their classified section well, um, so most of the, not all of these things have to do with that, but a lot of these do, like up in the upper left, buy or sell stuff, classified, well, you, regular display ads would be that too, but also classified sections, uh, buy or sell a car, typically in the classified section, find a job or fill a job, classified section, sell or buy a home, typically tell classified section. So about half of these things were coming up in the classified section. And then you had other things, uh, like, you know, help me unwind, you're just reading for the fun of reading. Um, update the business news, uh, keep me deeply informed with the politics, things like that. Uh, keep me productive while I wait. So you're you're waiting in a, uh, a dentist office or whatever, and you can read the newspaper. So, you know, about half of these things related to the classified section, about half of them to other sections. But the next uh, slide here, uh, shows what happened. There's a company called Craigslist, and and it's free. You can post as many classified ads as you want to for free. Um, I've bought my last few. Use, I usually buy used cars in America because I don't drive them most of the year since I'm overseas. And so I buy a car there. I can buy a, a van and you know for like a thousand dollars because we have a big inventory of used cars there, and. Uh, so I immediately go to Craigslist. Now there's also autotraders.com is also for buying uh, and selling cars. Um, the monster.com is for finding or filling jobs. Realtor.com for buying or selling a home. Uh, so, you know, these have all been, th these companies, the one that they, that uh, publishers identify as the one that has really destroyed them is, is Craigslist. It's the one that just really hurt. These other ones hurt also. Um, but Craigslist was the first one that came in with just free advertising. You know, put as much advertising as you want. So you, if you're looking for something, you have anybody that's trying to sell something, an idiot not to put, post it in Craigslist because it's free. And so that decimated the, uh, uh, the classified section for newspapers. And then you had other options. Uh, TV obviously is helping people, more people go to TV for unwinding than they used to. In the 1930s, there was no TV. And so the choice between newspapers and, and radio, um, TV wasn't very good in the 1950s. So uh, we started watching TV. I, I was a child in those days and still have, still can recall some of the, my favorite shows uh, when it's black and white and uh, very few options. Uh, but uh, so TV is certainly uh, uh, the main competitor when it comes to relaxing, unwinding, enjoying yourself for the evening. Uh, Bloomberg has, uh, and of course the Wall Street Journal uh, separately, but Bloomberg uh, is stealing a lot of their uh, attention. Again, 
boy, when we advertise, we're selling people's attention. And so if other people are stealing their attention, we're stealing, they're also stealing advertising, uh, directly or indirectly. Um, so in the case of Craigslist, for example, it doesn't sell much advertising. I'm not even sure how they make their money. Uh, I don't see a real good business plan. But they have lots of people coming to Craigslist. Uh, so somehow they're making some money off of that. Uh, but it's a very cheap, uh, they've set up a very cheap uh, organization. So they don't have many costs. And and they're you know just driving lots of traffic there. And when you have traffic, that's people's attention. And so you're selling people's attention. That's uh, that's advertising. Um, you know, the Economist, uh, you know, keep people deeply informed, uh, you know, different publications, obviously, you're competing with. But also, I would say, um, particularly the, the the increase of of news in these bot in these uh, lower left ones, particularly the increase of news on the Internet is killing them. Uh, because why pay for the New York Times if you can get it free on the internet? And there's so many sources of of news on the internet uh, that, like I say, they're just, they're losing all sorts of. They used to be over a million subscribers to the New York Times. Now they're under 900,000, and I think they're at about one and a half million. So they've they've dropped about a third of their subscribers, and that's why I say, where at what point do they decide before we lose any more? How do we try to get them over? They're charging. Basically, they they're one of the few newspapers that dares to charge uh, for online for an online subscription. Um, anyway, they're claiming to make be banking a profit, but I think they're they're endangering their whole future by by not uh, being more drastic in some of the changes they're making. But they may want to be one of the few that does survive. Who knows? Uh, the, he, he says the same thing has happened to banks outside of our industry, but uh, we saw the same things in, in banks where uh, they were making payments, they were had a uh, checking and savings account. I'm not sure if anybody knows what a check is in this part of the world. But, uh, you know, in America, we still use checks that we can write out in, in place of a debit card, uh, especially if we're paying bills uh, that, that like energy or something and we just write out a check and stick it in the mail. Uh, we still you know, use the old style for that. We usually use a debit card for or a credit card for purchases at a store, but uh, uh, not so much with something that uh, where we don't want to stop in person and they may not even have a place to stop in person to pay. Uh, and then you send them a check. Uh, but there's lots of different things that, that uh, banks were doing, student loans, uh, business loans, Growth loans, personal loans, credit cards, mortgages, uh, real estate mortgages, that sort of stuff. And now they have a lot of other competitors too. I couldn't get a better copy of this. Uh, I was copying this from a uh, presentation he made, and this one was not very quality. But anyway, PayPal for payments, uh, um, Cabbies for small business loans. A lot of different companies are attacking them in different things and making. Well, in the case of going back to the newspapers, um, which is more dealing with what we're talking about, uh, like, in, like I said, in the case of Craigslist, suddenly economically, it just makes no sense to put your classified ad or to look for something that would be sold in a classified section in the newspaper uh, when you have Craigslist. Uh, it's just so, you know, New York Times has had to drop a lot of, all the newspapers have dropped a lot of income. Uh, as we pointed out, more than two-thirds of their income is gone now. Uh, they've lost advertising, and a good big chunk of that advertising they lost was uh, to classified ads. Uh, but they also lost a lot of display ads, too. Okay, any questions on... Um, well, how, how do these... You know, there are some other slides I can show that, uh, and I do have uh, some um, some URLs here uh, if you're interested in his theories in more depth. Um, in the business side, um, I think 
I mean, we, we just from the New York Times, we can see some ways in looking for jobs not done or jobs not done well. Uh, in many cases, that's really the question. Uh, you're looking for that edge to come into a market. Can I come in at a much cheaper price, such as Craigslist coming in free, um, as opposed to paying for ads in the classified section? Uh, can I come in and, and change the, you know, the habits of consumers? And so free is better than paid, obviously. Uh, simple is better than complicated. Um, not to say that uh, everything with a newspaper is complicated, but there are uh, areas in communications where things get complicated that other people can simplify. Or there are things that we're looking at in the future um, faster and faster. We, they're just, uh, in the last few days, they've been talking, or last couple of weeks anyway, last few weeks, about the uh, about Google, they have been investing their money in in uh, disruptive innovation, uh, partly because uh, because of Clayton Christensen. Uh, one of the videos that I re would refer you to on this PowerPoint is his disc his discussion of his theories to Google executives, and so they have very much taken his uh, advice. And uh, one thing that they're doing is is kind of like IBM did is that they spin off companies that are totally disassociated with with Google. It was about like 10 years ago that they started they started a mother company, which is kind of weird to, to have children start a mother company. Uh, but they started a, a company to oversee all of their subsidiaries. And so Google itself is no longer the mother company. Google was the mother company, so to speak. It's no longer the mother company of that of that corporation. Uh, they have a I forget the name of it, but they have a, a company over Google, but it's also over all of their new companies. And so they're spending billions of dollars every year looking for new disruptive technologies. And they just announced that they have uh, created uh, a, a, the, a, a functional quantum computer that when they fed it a challenge that they said would take 10,000 years to solve, they solved it in 200 seconds with this new quantum computer. Um, IBM disputed that it would take 10,000 years. They probably created their their uh, uh, supercomputer that, that that Google was using and probably sold it to them. But uh, they IBM said uh, you could yeah you could have done it in two and a half days with a supercomputer. Well, it's still a lot longer than 200 seconds. And so quantum computers are are the thing. China's working real hard on them. Uh, I was just uh, looking at uh, something from the South China News that they're, the estimate is that China is maybe three to five years behind America in that, but they're working in other areas. It looks like I, I didn't read enough to quite comprehend. They're not as they're not as far along in quantum computers, but they are. Looks like they're further ahead in some of the quantum applications, and how you you uh, uh, how they will ultimately. Um, implement quantum computers. So that's looking to the, another curve ahead of perhaps of Google and IBM and Intel. Um, but again, we're looking at the innovations and you start figuring out, okay, what, how can I disrupt the, the industry with these innovations? Um, <clears throat> certainly quantum computing will be very disruptive. Uh, and, and Google's in a place where they can Im implement quantum computing in their own company and their other uh, company and in, in the company, you know, in, in Google itself. Um, it suddenly that speeds up. Well, I mean, what do you do if, if suddenly you have computing that is no less than um, well, 200 seconds compared to 2.5 days? What would that be? I mean, like, you know, That's less than four minutes. There are how many minutes in a day? Uh, 24 times 60. Yeah. Anyway, 200 seconds is a lot less than two and a half days. And so suddenly there are speeds that, that Google itself can implement on the internet with their internet services uh, can take quantum leaks forward. Uh, so that's, uh, that's going to put them ahead in many other areas. Uh, not just in computing, you know, directly, but in all the fields that they are involved in that have any computer involvement, which is essentially everything, right? 
what does Google do that doesn't involve a computer? I don't think there's anything they do. And so everything they're doing will, will be enhanced by their breakthrough in quantum computing. Uh, so, you know, watch Google, see what they, how, how they think they can hit that next curve. Uh, but I'm presuming that they, they don't want IBM to steal the market when IBM catches up to them or Intel. And so they need to also be looking at all the applications, just like China apparently already is, and start looking at uh, how they can uh, get into new fields with their faster computing, whether they can get create a PC with quantum computing. You know, at that point, how do you actually, you know, quantum computing, I think, is with a very big computer at this point. How At what rate can you start developing smaller computers for regular consumers? Um, I don't know. Or is that going to be their... Maybe that's where you plug into the Google network. You know, they're, they're certainly working in the cloud. So maybe this idea that a lot of uh, companies have been pushing where you have a dumb computer, has hardly any memory, but you're linking into the mother load of com computational speed and you're letting that uh, run it for you from the cloud through the cloud. So you have very little software in your computer but Google is providing all this cool soft, all this cool uh, software uh, through their cloud, and you're just paying a fee for the cloud and and uh, having being able to do stuff that you couldn't imagine doing before. Uh, I'm not sure where it's going from here. Um, you know, we've seen other uh, other innovations uh, uh, such as uh, 3D imaging, 3D videos. Uh, created by different companies that have never taken off, but you know it's uh, it's possible to do in our field to use uh, 3D projections. We've seen newspapers, videos of newspapers that uh, uh, where it's just basically one sheet of paper, and you just touch it, and you get another page, and you touch it, you get another page, but it looks like a real newspaper. It's kind of like what I the way I was thinking. I mentioned I think uh, you know 20 years ago when I was trying in my mind to invent more or less with an iPad, but one that my mother would use, my 80-year mom would do. Uh, something that looked like a book and that would have internally, you know, thousands of books that she could read, but it would still look like a book that would close up like a book, open up like a book, you, you know, one button access to your directory of all the books in your, in your, in your uh, iBook, you say. And, uh, uh, you know, so, you know, you start, you know, looking just where the innovation is going to go. What will, pe what will appeal to people? Because ultimately it's how do you hit the market? How do you find a market of non-consumers? People who are not satisfied with what's currently offered and can't afford it, not satisfied with it. How do you approach them and build a new business or save your current business in the case of traditional media? Where do they go from here? Uh, they're going to fall even further behind Google uh, if Google controls, you know, the computers that that uh, have, can, you know, amplify speeds, you know, 10,000 fold or something. Um, so where do we go? Um, again, my point is, I, I think uh, you, you need to think about communication uh, theory and go beyond the theories that you may be learning in a theory class here or in any university um, is the theory of disruptive innovation, a theory that could be used in one of your uh, uh, theses, for example. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Disrupt disruptive innovation is very powerful. It, it, has, it approaches it from the business side. Um, and there's, uh, there's various implications of it. Like I say, his, his theories don't just, it's just one theory, it's really a, a group of theories uh, and how to um, anticipate, how to, how to get to the next curve, how to implement and break into a market uh, that has an oligopoly that's controlling it right now uh, or a monopoly. Um, what is uh, the future? You know, we were talking about the future of traditional media. Is there a way to save it? Uh, what would be the techniques? Uh, again, he was the one that helped 
uh, this newspaper association start exploring, and he's the one that said you have to get together and fight fight off the online competition together, or you're, you're going to fail separately. And they ignored him with that, and so that's why you know I've been playing in my own mind ideas. Could I gather even at this late time of their in their desperation gather you know, maybe a thousand newspapers, a lot of them weekly newspapers that would work together um, in, in fighting off the, the giants, the online giants. Or how could somebody? So I talked about that in some of my research. Okay, in a couple of minutes here, uh, the quiz will open up. The, uh, what I was explaining to one person, I didn't bother to answer her email and I didn't, maybe there's some other emails I ignored also. I, I tried to explain at the end of last class when I walked around with, with the quiz last week that there were about a third of you uh, looking at that web page trying to find answers uh, because we only had one question. You know, what, what were some of the examples from that one article or that introduction to the book? Um, and so people not having read it, uh, we're desperate to find answers, and that was not allowed. And so I purposely just closed the quiz, and I'm not going to count the quiz. Uh, uh, that, in a way, is a punishing those who actually did read it, and I'm sorry about that. But it was just out of control. Like I said, when you have a third of the class, you know, trying to cheat on a on a quiz, it was probably the nature of it, and the fact that 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 was available online, that. Uh, uh, made that possible for people to decide that they could cheat and uh, and uh, you know answer that one question with uh, some quick access to that website. Um, so I'm not going to create a quiz like that again. That's one of the things I learned. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, uh, I did include in the today's quiz um, one question from that and. Uh, Anyway, we'll just uh, redistribute the, the points. Um, anyway, so that quiz, last week's quiz didn't count. Uh, so in, uh, in just a few seconds, you this quiz will open up. You have 10 questions, 10 minutes. Um, so I can't remember exactly when it turns on. I think right, right about now it's going to turn on. But you have until it closes, I know, at 51 at uh, 451. Um, and so you don't need to be in a big hurry. You've got 10 minutes whenever it is you start. So, so we'll end this presentation. You can go ahead and get ready or start your quiz.